All right there. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Scott. This is Drawing Together with Artists Network. We are here going to be working on this drawing of the skull. So welcome back, everybody. A lot of familiar faces and names. So um, I'm really excited about this one. This is another kind of do-over. What we, were, what we tackled last week was the cup, which was the very first episode. And I wanted to try that again to see if there's any improvement. I'm doing that again today with the skull, a different uh, perspective on the skull and a different set of materials this time. Uh, so today I'm working with the toned paper. Um, so this is just a Strathmore gray tone paper. I've got charcoal pencils. I've got my HB and my 6B. I don't know if I'm really going to be using much of the, actually much of the 6B. I'll probably be using most of the HB. Um, I've got this white chalk uh, pastel that I'm going to be using to build up some of the lights. My shading stump and, of course, my two erasers. My, uh, my monoplastic eraser and my kneaded eraser. If you have a, just a rubber eraser, that works just as well. Um, so um, before we get started, I just want to check things out here in the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, it's awesome, again, to see everybody chiming in from where you're from. So uh, feel free to shout that out. I love to see where everybody is um, viewing from, people from all over the world. So. Um, Let's see, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them out in all caps. I'll be more likely to see this, and this does go up as a recording afterwards, so if you just wanna sit back and watch and then try this again later, follow along, go right ahead. And everything I do here, in general, the concepts can be applied to um, charcoal or graphite if you're using a different drawing medium. Again, the, the challenge that I'm setting for myself here is to try new materials. So I've already drawn this skull, that's this, this guy right back here, um, and uh, the but by changing up the materials, I'm going to see if it gives me a different perspective on this subject and, a, and develop a certain a different set of skills. Um, I chose to eliminate some of that background information on this and really make this a skull study. And what really emerged for this in this preparatory drawing for me was the role of the gray paper um, is perhaps. Um, more challenging in this drawing than any other drawing that we've done on toned paper so far, um, in part because the subject itself is white. And so the instinct is to go right for that white pastel and start drawing that. And what I did is I really forced myself to bring in that white later and towards the end and rely more on the toned paper and more on dropping down the value of the darks in this. And so if you're a new artist, if you're, if you're new to drawing, some of these terms may be unfamiliar to you, but I'm going to go through those as we go and see if it, see if it makes sense. So let's dig right into it. Um, again, starting with the toned paper, I... I have to remind myself that I'm gonna be able to build the values up from here. So if you're thinking about the value scale as a gradation of, of grays moving from white to black, we're sitting here not at a middle gray, it's a little bit closer to the light side, um, but still relatively dark. You can see with the white um, uh, chalk here that it's quite a bit darker than what the white offers me. Um, what's going to happen throughout the drawing process, though, is that I'm going to kind of calibrate to this. My mind is going to tell me that this is white at some point. It's going to view this as the lightest light. Um, and then I'm going to really kind of leverage that later on in the drawing by bringing the white in on top and expanding that value range. Again, that may be kind of confusing at this point, but hopefully throughout the process, it'll all make sense. Um, and, uh, Joy is asking, is that an HB charcoal or graphite pencil? This is all charcoal, so this is my HB um, charcoal pencil. Um, I like these general charcoal pencils, and I've, I've used a razor blade to kind of shave this away to expose more of that core, and that's going to allow me to, to build up um, a greater kind of swatch of value um, than if I were to um, if I were to use my, uh, just the, the point of the pencil. I just saw this. Who is this? Gail Claypool from Bath, Maine, my hometown. Uh, it's so exciting. I don't see many people from Bath. So I'm a graduate of Morris High. And uh, that's awesome. Welcome, everybody. Rachel, I see you on here. Uh, yes, it is a beautiful day in Colorado. Um, uh, Joni is saying it's your first time working with tone paper. Um, so give this a shot. Uh, I'm so excited to see how this, uh, this turns out for you. So throughout this drawing, if you feel like chiming in and, and giving us a sense of what's working for you and what's not, I'd, uh, 
I'd, uh, I'd love to hear what that is. And so for everybody here, again, this is really, it's about drawing together. So sharing your observations of what I'm doing and what you're doing as well is really important. If you see something that's off in my drawing, don't hesitate to call that out. That's why we're here is we're, um, your observations help me to, to build my drawing. Um, so this initial attempt that I'm going to make is to just to start reacting to forms on the page. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about in this whole series is, th th is the idea that there are multiple approaches to initiating a drawing. Um, and in many of the drawings I've been doing so far, I've initiated the process by building up blocks of value rather than using line. And I think I'm going to switch that up in, in this point at, for this drawing and, and actually start by exploring the, the contour of the skull. So as I'm doing that, I'm trying to make broad observations now. Um, the one thing that is consistent with what we've been how we've been approaching drawing so far in the series is that we want this drawing to emerge at the same rate that our skills of observation are developing. So as we observe things in the skull, our drawing is going to be coming together and the act of drawing is going to help us to observe things in that skull. One thing I forgot to mention is if you are following along, the reference image is in the description below. And so you can find that link, copy and paste it into your browser, and, uh, and you can pull it up as a, a larger image rather than having to work for the smaller thumbnail here. Uh, so um, the other thing is, is when you're done, I'd love to see the work you've been uh, uh, completing by sharing it on the Drawing Together page on Artist Network. You'll find a link for the specific episode uh, that you, where you can where you can share your, your drawings of the skull and you actually can see the other skull episode and see those other drawings from that first skull episode there um, so that it'll be really interesting to see some development there uh, I saw some really great drawings Cindy I believe that was you that posted um, some drawings this morning um, Heather I see a lot of your your drawings as well um, and so I just a couple names that I've been, I've been seeing frequently throughout the process. Um, you can see that I'm holding the pencil on its side. I really want to engage the side of the pencil as much as possible. Even though I'm making these lines, I'm, not, I'm trying not to switch to this tripod grip that really forces the tip of the pencil into the page. That kind of creates an embossed mark that can be difficult to deal with. So utilizing the side of the pencil encourages me to, to keep things loose and not get bogged down in details. I'm also trying to just get a feel for some of these marks, trying them out, see how they, they, see how they feel, and then I can adjust from there. This initial gesture is a reaction to the form on the page, getting a sense for how it fills the space of the page. It's not about being accurate, it's about getting information down so that I have something to evaluate and I can continue to adjust throughout the process. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I've been looking through a lot of drawing books lately, books on how to draw, and one of the things I see consistently throughout that, throughout my, that my research there is this approach to drawing in which you build from certain shapes. You draw shapes and you draw that are bigger, um, you draw more precise shapes on top and more precise shapes and you gradually move to detail. And I think that's a really healthy process, but one of the things that might be missing in some of those instructional books is how to correct as you go. Correcting is something that I do all the time and if I approach my drawing with that mindset uh, then I'm not afraid to adjust any of the marks. If I approach my drawing from a, a point of view where I make a mark, it stays there and I just build marks on top, if those initial marks are off then everything else will be off from that. And what I've learned throughout my you know 20 plus years of drawing is that those initial marks are always off, <laughs> never right, because I haven't sat with the subject enough, right? I, I've, I, when I look at this uh, skull, you can take a quick glance and immediately know it's a skull. And in that quick glance, everything about that skull is kind of processed by your subconscious. And, and all you need to know is that it's a skull. We don't take the time to really analyze what is that visual information that that is telling me that it is a skull. The drawing process does that. It, it gets us to the point where we're observing the specific visual information that says that this is this particular skull. 
and that takes time. You're not going to get it right off the bat. I'm not going to get that initial shape right off the bat. I'm going to always be correcting it. So um, I see some additional comments here before I get going. Um, uh, Maddie's mom saying you have royal charcoal, medium and soft. So this, that the medium would be equivalent to about an HB here. So, and then the, uh, the 6B is, is, would be equivalent to the soft. I'm glad it's nice there out in Bath. There, Gail. Um, let's do, 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 do. Uh, Nia, you're saying I did the feet drawing, but I'm too scared to post it. Uh, I, I get that. It makes sense. Whatever you're comfortable with, you know, um, just know it's a supportive environment. And uh, all right. But, you know, sometimes you do drawings and this, that, that's really kind of the point of the, this, uh, this whole process is that we're drawing for ourselves here. We're drawing together, but we're doing it for ourselves. If you feel like sharing, great. If not, that is something that I can completely connect with. Um, so you can see this general form establishing, and I've been doing this by simply reacting to the form as I glance quickly back and forth between the, uh, the reference photo and my drawing. So when I'm looking at the reference, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is kind of take a mental snapshot of the angle, the length of each segment of the skull, and then I'm glancing at the page to check in where I'm at. And at this point, I find it most effective to, uh, to think about these sections of short uh, straight marks rather than curves. So rather than seeing this curve, I'm gonna try to break that up into these shorter sections. And now, as I have that information down, I can start to make some specific corrections. Um, I'm also trying to observe there's an axis forming here for the general angle of the skull that seems to be appearing here. Uh, and that, that feels correct. I can do some angle sighting if I take that general axis, compare it to the drawing, that feels correct. Um, the, I have the, the, this camera overhead, this overhead shot is in front of me, um, and that's allowing me to see the drawing correctly without any sort of dis perspective distortion like I am from this angle here. Um, and it's also a little bit smaller. So I can see things um, more holistically when it's smaller. So if for you, it's helpful to set it up at a distance and gauge it from there quickly and do that periodically throughout the drawing. So that's something I'm, I'm going to try to be leveraging throughout the process as well. All right, so I, uh, now at this point, as I have kind of a rough shape for the skull established, I wanna to start to examine what are some key comparisons that I can be making. So I have here the back of that jaw becomes a key point. If I draw a horizontal line across here, I can see on the reference photo, where would it intersect the skull? And I see the cheekbone here as another landmark that is above that line. It's right in line. If I continue this angle here, it leads me right to that cheekbone. Um, I see another kind of landmark here where I have this curve right here in the, that eye socket, that bone that forms the outer edge of that eye socket. That's a landmark, and if I draw a plumb line down here, I can see where it intersects that skull, and I can compare that to the reference photo in that back corner of the jawline kind of is just slightly off to the left of this mark. So that gives me a, a kind of a point of reference, and I can start to adjust from there. And so, but because I have that initial uh, those initial, mark, initial marks established, um, I can make concrete decisions about how to, how to change those. Uh, so I'm starting to establish these landmarks, and one of the things I want to kind of be mindful of is that if I form this axis from this cheekbone following up through this cheekbone, I know where this cheekbone is going to lie on that lie on that axis. I need to figure out what that distance is from here to here now. So I want to make sure I have enough room for that, those, the eye sockets there, the nose. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to do some comparative measuring. I'm going to visually try to take this distance here and compare it to this distance. So if I, if I go like this, align the left side of the pencil with this edge of the skull, my thumb here marks 
the distance then to that eye socket, I can compare that distance here from the eye socket to the other eye socket, and it's about a one-to-one -one relationship. Now I can go to the reference photo and I can compare the two. And what I'm seeing is that this distance here should be shorter than this distance. So what I'm left with are two options. I can either bring this in or I can move this out. I've locked in some of these dimensions and landmarks in the center of the skull and I can move fluidly now in either direction. And what I think I want to do is actually lock this down, keep this distance, and then expand this one out. Just because I want to make sure I have enough room to move there. Hello, hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, people have gone, uh, viewing from all over. Um, it's awesome. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm, I'm now, because I have these two kind of outer parameters established, I can uh, start to um, lock in some of these other um, other features here. So if I get the nose socket, uh, one of the things that I see is if I take a horizontal line from this point here, where at the, the back end of that jaw, and I carry that across, that pretty much aligns with the base of the, the nose socket there. And now I look at this negative space in here, and that seems to be okay. So now I'm going through and essentially just correcting as I go. And each time, it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. Before I make a mark, I want to do a quick check-in with other elements around it to make sure I'm in the right spot and seeing what can I use to help inform those decisions. Um, so then I have the, you know, the top of that nose here. You know, the turn here at, the, the, at the, the bridge of the nose, I'm comparing it to this position of the, the nose socket. I can create an axis here along the brow. I think this needs to come up a little bit to start to draw that in. So this is a, a bit of a different approach than to, to drawing than what we've, we've seen in some of the others. Um, and hopefully what that's showing is that, you know, there's, there's no one way to draw. There are many ways and you can choose what works for you broadly and then also kind of specifically for that drawing. Um, and you can choose to change things up as you go. So as I'm looking at the curve up here on this part of that eye socket where it breaks from the rest of the skull, doing a quick check-in, do it dropping a kind of a visual plumb line down there to make sure that that's placed in the right spot. And so then if I know that this distance here is shorter than this distance, what that does is that suggests that the back of the skull should actually be somewhere around here. So I'm going to do some quick indicators. And, you know, kind of giving myself a kind of a rough target over here to evaluate the, the, the uh, proportions. There's really kind of a flatness to this back edge here that I, I kind of missed in this initial attempt. So we're getting to that ugly duckling stage pretty early on. So if you're new, <laughs> if you're new to the series, um, one of the things we talk about a lot in this is that in, in this whole series is that drawings will often go through what we refer to as an ugly duckling stage, a stage where it feels like everything's just going to fall apart. Um, but if you stick with it and you power through it, you end up at a point in your drawing that is more precise and more specific. Um, so allow yourself to kind of go through that. What I've seen in some um, beginning uh, artists, drawers, is this resistance towards change throughout the process and a tendency to, um, if you get to the point where it's, if it's just not working, just wipe it all down and start from scratch. And my philosophy is to leave your mistakes and leave the, the incorrect marks 
until you figured out what the correct ones should be because it's really easy to essentially replicate the incorrect marks um, if you erase them if, and, uh, and then try to take another stab at it. So one of the things you might notice too is that I'm not getting bogged down by drawing teeth or anything. This is called angle sighting, where I'm taking this angle here, I'm aligning my pencil with the angle of this sec section of the jaw, comparing it to my drawing. And there's a turn along in here. Again, if I draw a plumb line up, I can see where it should be intersecting the, the, the skull, and it kind of cuts through the eye socket right about here. And this is, when, when I did my preparatory drawing, I really struggled with this, the placement of this lower jawline, moved it quite a bit. Um, I had locked into it too early. So I'm kind of remembering that experience and trying not to, to replicate that. Um, now what I want to do is, now that I have the basic features put in there, I'm going to do a quick check-in looking at the spaces between them. This is something that we talked about in other portrait drawing episodes, is that it's really easy to get locked into the specific features and, and treat them in isolation. And I started to do that here, drawing the eyes, drawing the nose, the mouth down here, and thinking about them as separate things. And now what I want to do is flip my thinking to the spaces between them, what connects them, and what are the proportions there, the distance between the eye socket and the nose, for example. What's the distance down then from the nose to the jaw? So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And so one of the, the great things that the skull kind of provides us as a challenge, it's such a unique form, and there's so many features and kind of points to it, it's a great opportunity to really sharpen our, um, our proportion skills. All right, so I'm just kind of roughing in the kind of the upper portion of the teeth, the, you know, where the gums would be, um, and trying to envision, envision the basic lines and that's as far as I'm going to go for now. I'm going to bring in those teeth kind of later on. Um, now, one of the reasons I, I have started drawings in the past by thinking about larger shapes of value is that it's harder for me to interpret um, the proportions of things when they're an outline. They don't quite have enough substance to them. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start to drop in some blocks of value so that I can start to see this as a mass rather than as lines. We often interpret things when they're just an outline differently, when they don't have that substance. Um, I'm gonna do some cross hatching here. So, and I wanna try to get rid of any sort of directional marks. So I'm just using my palm to do that uh, rather than my fingers, because I don't want to um, leave any of the oils from my fingers on there on the page. And one of the things I'm observing now is um, the, the shadow shape here. Um, so for, for those of you who have been following along for a while, you'll be familiar with these terms, but there um, are three terms when it comes to sh shading that you want to be familiar with. There's a cast shadow, there's a form shadow, and then the shadow shape. What I wanted to do now is I, is work on the shadow, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the shadow shape. The form shadow is a shadow that is on the skull. You know, we can see a contrast from light to dark, and we can see a distinct shadow back here. It's casting a shadow as well, so that's the second type of shadow is the cast shadow. If you combine the two together, you end up with what's called the shadow shape. And that's what I want to observe now. And so I'm letting that consume the line that I established for the back of the skull. 
and there's enough of an indicator that I'm confident that I'll be able to bring that back. And I can find that again. Um, but what I, what, I'm, what I really wanted to make sure I do is unify the cast shadow and the form shadow um, so that it all sits back. If I create too much contrast here, if I define the difference between those too much right now, there's a chance that that skull will kind of pop forward. I really want to kind of push this back. And you can see up here in the reference photo, there's a, almost a sense that it blends in with the background. The value contrast is so minimal here. When I squint at it, that line almost disappears. And then we come up here and then there's a greater contrast where that white jumps out, it contrasts highly against that darker background. What I might do is actually enhance that a little bit more by kind of darkening this side of the skull. So as I'm doing this, I'm using the side of the pencil, I'm rolling it gently in my fingers as I go so that I'm, it's, I'm continually rounding that pencil. Uh, I need to change up the direction of my marks. And I'm not worried about the edge at this point. I want to go right over that edge. Um, there was a great question, and I can't remember who that was. If you're, if you're watching and you, you posted the question on the Drawing Together page, I believe it was with the cup, the last ones, um, you're asking about um, halos. Um, I refer to that quite a bit uh, throughout the, the drawing process. Um, when I, what I'm talking about with halos are, are, regards the edges of an object. So right now we have a kind of a line that defines the edge, the contour of this three-dimensional object. If I'm working on that background there, and I tighten up my marks leading up to it, I'm going to perceive that. The viewer is going to see that change in marks. And, and that can often then lead to a change in value, either getting lighter or darker leading right up to that edge. And then that suggests that kind of a halo which flattens out the space. So what I want to try to do is I want to make that background more con continuous as it leads up to that edge. So by crossing right over the edge of the skull, I can ensure that. because I can, I can then come back in with my eraser and kind of clean that edge up. And kind of work both positively and negatively. So it's just something you want to kind of be sensitive to. So right now there's a bit of that dark halo. It's a little bit darker here. And I can, what I can do is I can kind of smooth out that transition leading up to that edge. And the more gradual that transition, the less we'll interpret that as a halo. And I don't know if that's the exact term or not. Um, that's what I use at least as a term. And I'm not sure where that, where I picked it up from. So if, if I took a class with you <laughs> and you're the one who used that, used that term, then thank you. Um, but it's one of the areas that, you know, in general, details are less critical for drawing than we kind of give them credit for. But in this case, the, what we do around the edges is really kind of an important thing that we want to pay attention to. And you might want to uh, spend more time there than you, you might otherwise feel inclined to. Okay. Yes, the skull does look like he's friendly and smiling. I kind of like that. <laughs> so thank you, um, OBB. So. Uh, I just want to check here again for questions. Not seeing here. Um, all right, coming back down. Yeah, there could be, let's see, it looks like some people might be experiencing some sort of delay. Hopefully, um, I see, what's going on here? Is it working? Looks like it's working. There we go. I apologize if there's been a lag in uh, the, um, a lag in the process. I do need to pause for just a second because I realized my computer became unplugged and it's about to die. There we go. That would be an unpleasant experience for the computer to just die out. 
um, uh, uh, um, M-A-R-D-Y-L-A-K-E is having a hard time making a sharp pencil. Maybe you need to change the blade more often. Yes, that is a mistake that I've made for a long time. <laughs> I would just, I kind of forget to change the blade and especially when sharpening charcoal and graphite, it can really dull it more quickly than we uh, might anticipate. So if you, if you notice the, the, uh, um, the casing or the, I mean, sorry, the, the core kind of breaking, whether it's graphite or charcoal, um, switch to a sharper blade that tends to help quite a bit. Um, so Richard is asking about books. I, you know, I don't know, I, there are so many drawing books out there that I'm not sure whether um, I can make the statement that most kind of describe it one way or the other, but just the ones that I have been looking at tend, tend to do that. Um, let me think if I uh, um, have any recommendations about books. There's a lot out there and I don't want to kind of negate that because you can learn so much from those, those drawing books that do teach that way. Um, I just wanted to kind of, it was something that kind of stood out for me is that um, what, what I found missing is that, um, is that, that kind of the process, how do you fix things? So let me do some research and see if there's one that currently exists. Um, that's something that I'm actually working on right now is a, a book to help people. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really kind of focusing on. Um, okay. Ah, skullful drawing, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mad moments go. Thank you for that comment. Okay, um, I'm getting a little distracted here. I need to clear my brain a little bit. So right, what's happening now, I, I notice, is that, again, my, my brain is starting to calibrate to the tone of the paper. And so I'm doing a quick check-in to rec remember that this is gray, and I can build the lights from that. So um, let's... Um, let's kind of rein that back in. Uh, Richard, you know, uh, there, we, have, we have a series of drawing videos um, called The Art and Science of Drawing. His name is Brent Evison, who creates those, and I really enjoy the way he teaches. We filmed, uh, but also have a couple figure drawing um, courses and videos with him. So Figure Drawing Essentials with Brent is an excellent one, and I really like the way he approaches drawing. Um, so give that a shot. Um, and then we also, he also did some other figure drawing videos that we have on ATV. So his name is Brent Eviston. Um, okay, so I lost my reference. There it is. Okay. Now what I want to do is now that I've made a mess of the edges, I'm going to start to clean that up a little bit. I'm going to do some negative drawing first by using my eraser, thinking about where the lights might go. So where I might be adding white, um, I want to I want to kind of clean things off a little bit. It's kind of hard to see. Actually, now I want to do the the skull, the nose here, and I'm going to kind of block in that general shape first. And we'll make it more specific. That, that white pencil is going to be really great for getting that ridge along the nose. Um, actually, what I want to do, I see this kind of triangular shape here on the side of the nose that I want to rough in. And you can see I'm not being very specific with it. I'm taking a, making a general kind of observation about it. And I'm going to use the blending stump to actually refine that a little bit. And I need to remind myself to move around the drawing. I don't want to get bogged down in any particular area at this point. And then this is now, I just observed <laughs> this. Uh, this is the, the hole that where the optic nerve travels from the eye into the brain. Um, I, that was a, that was, the same thing happened when I did my preparatory drawing. I get to the very end and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a, a large black hole right there <laughs> that I completely ignored. Um, and so I'm catching it a little bit earlier this time, but it's funny how the mind does that. It just completely glanced over that. Um, and that kind of reiterates what I was saying earlier about the drawing evolving 
with the rate of our observations. There are certain things that we just, we're not going to see when we take a quick glance at something. And so um, what I've observed with some students is there's a tendency to make, take a quick glance at the subject and then just hone in on the drawing and spend two hours working on a drawing without ever looking back at the reference, whether that's a life, uh, working from life or from a reference photo like this. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, kind of do a quick check-in right now. If you haven't looked at the reference in a while, the now's a kind of a good time to really kind of step back and look at that. I'm using kind of, I want to try to use more circular marks. I'm realizing that some of the directional marks are kind of working against me. And I can start to really refine this um, right here, right here in the temple. Still using the side of the pencil. And now I'm kind of really trying to observe this shape here. And then we have some negative drawing here where this shadow drops in behind that the, um, the edge of the cheekbone there. And then I can use my eraser to kind of cut that back out and you get a nice clean edge without having to use a line there. Uh, so one of the things we've talked a lot about in this whole series is the value of line. Uh, so what we, when we, we see a line, it will often interpret that line as the edge of an object. So when I'm drawing out, say out here, I'm drawing the contour of that. So it's a line that represents the edge of a, a three-dimensional object. Lines don't exist in nature, however, um, and when I'm working in the, in the interior of the skull, I want to be mindful of the direction of the marks that I have. And you can use your lines to reinforce the structure of something. Um, but, you know, if a line is off or if a line is too intense, sometimes what can happen is the brain can interpret that as the edge of an object when it's actually not, when it shouldn't be. So uh, if I look back in here, for example, you know, I see some folds in here and I, I want to be mindful not to use a line there because then that would suggest the edge when it's not really the edge. Oh, and I see this right down in here. So we've got this hole that in, in the, the jaw. I'm going to do a quick check-in to see where it is relative to this shadow. And we have some shadows under here. And this is all kind of a mess. Right here, I, when I look at it, I can't quite make sense of it all at first. So I'm just going to try to block that in, and that's going to be an area we come back to and refine farther. And that's generally the approach I like to take as well, is, is I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in one area too much. If I can't make an initial decision about what mark to make, it's a lot of the words make there. Um, if I can't decide really what marks need to take place, what marks need to happen, just rough it in, move to something else, come back to it, kind of take another stab at it, and then at some point in the drawing process, it'll just click. So I can start to define this edge a little bit more. And I'm trying to be really mindful of this line here. I don't want it to be too strong of a line. I fall, have this fall into shadow here. And I might actually minimize what's happening back here to draw attention to the, the front of the skull. So I'm kind of, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm not really spending too much time back here at this point, as I'm not sure how far I want to take the finish of the drawing back in here. And I might intentionally leave it unfinished and let that edge get lost and found. So I'm gonna, I want to leave that open to some kind of creative interpretation All right. All right, Richard Anthony, yes, yes. Brent, Brent Evison, I think he's a great artist to that. Um, he, he explains drawing very well. We have quite a few products by him, so check those out. Okay, so now I need to block in this 
other kind of patch of dark right here in that gap behind the teeth. So there are two things that I'm looking for. There's one is where does that intersect the cheekbone? And then also then the teeth, where if I'm drawing this negative space in here, this edge, where is it relative to other parts in the, of the drawing? And it pretty much divides the eye socket here. And I can look at that, that shape. And so that's often kind of, in general, the process that I like to follow is first think about where something goes and then think about the specifics of what it looks like. So for example, as I look at the socket, before I start drawing that specific shape, I want to first give myself an, myself an indication of where it's going to go. Okay. Um, All right, I'm glad, Nia, that you're making some comments about the live event. I'm glad that's that's helpful. Um, yeah, it is, you know, I think it, it all, it, we all learn in different ways. So for some of you, you may prefer to learn from a pre-recorded video, um, others from books, um, others from live instruction. Um, and what's awesome about this time is that we have so many options available to us now. All right, so I'm, I'm working on this edge here. I'm using the shading stump, um, and one of the things I need to be mindful of is, is that um, I wanna continue to roll it. So it's picked up some charcoal, and um, it's gonna be really helpful in actually establishing some of these forms. So if, you're, if you've been with us for a while, you'll have heard me say this before, but be mindful of the fact that the shading stump, this blending stump, is an opportunity to continue to refine the form. It's not just a tool to, to smooth out the marks and get rid of the tooth of the paper a bit. It's an opportunity to correct form and contribute to your understanding of that. So as, I'm doing, as I'm making these marks, I'm trying to be mindful of kind of correcting some of these edges, looking at what's called the cross contour. So if the contour lines define the outer edge of a three-dimensional object, the cross contour define marks that, that reinforce that three dimension. But we wanna be careful with those because if I make those marks too strong, it can kind of make the whole thing fall apart. It can feel too fractured. And so I, I like the blending stump for that as a tool because it tends to make softer marks than the charcoal itself. And I can always intensify a mark if I need to, but it's hard. To, to start with a mark that's too strong and then soften it. So I'm kind of trying to bounce around the drawing. Um, and, and, and in my mind, I'm kind of thinking, as, you know, if I didn't have the white pastel, could I make this work as it is? So I'm thinking about light and shadow. Um, and then the white is going to come in on top and hopefully add a kick to the whole process. really bring the drawing together, kind of pump up that contrast. Um, red, one, two, three, nine, five, zero. Of course, questions are always welcome. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, I welcome all questions and observations. You know, if you see anything that's off in the drawing that needs to be corrected, Give us a shout out. I think the you know having the ability to um, give and accept feedback is can be really challenging. So it's one of the things we practice as well. So. As I'm making these marks with the blending stump, I'm trying to remind myself to continually roll this in my fingers so I don't end up a with essentially flat spots on the blending stump where it's I've kind of removed all the charcoal and other areas where it's sticking more heavily. But So as I look in here, there's a lot going on in the structure. Um, and with this blending stump, I can, um, I can start to suggest that looking at the shapes 
of the shadows that are being formed. Um, and then I can see areas where I'm going to need to darken them up a little bit. I want to be careful with these marks here. I'm really just kind of pulling right in here so that it lifts off at this edge, but I'm kind of darkening as if I can. Kind of lost that edge of the skull, that's all right. Change the direction of the marks here. Red12395 is asking about starting up your own art channel. I say go for it. It's a bit more than I'll be able to cover in this session here. There's a lot that goes into it. So um, when I say get started and experiment with video, see what works, and go from there. All right. Okay, so as you can see, now I'm just kind of working through, trying to kind of move from spot to spot, looking at the structure. And as I'm doing that, I'm also trying to be mindful of the proportions, making sure everything fits. So if I'm working in this area, for example, um, when I'm moving from this spot here to this spot to this spot, ideally it lines up, you know, that everything kind of fits together. If I end up working with this kind of little um, kind of indent in the... Uh, in that cheekbone area, uh, hopefully as I'm moving up across this area, it's then, then aligning with the proper place on the, in the eye socket. Um, doing a lot of glancing at the reference photo trying to make observations. Something seems off down here. So this is the, again that area that really threw me off in the preparatory drawing. So as I'm, as I'm looking at the, the structure here and I'm trying to establish these shadows and I, I come down here, I work my way down to that bottom edge, something is off. And I need to now figure that out. So as I'm looking at, there's this little kind of flat spot here at the back of the jaw. Looking at it in relation to this, this kind of back spot here behind the teeth. So I apologize for the silence here as I'm just concentrating a bit more than I was earlier. Let me see, I kind of like that line actually. In, in the photo, this would just be a large dark area. But I kind of like what's happening with that line cutting through that the gray page. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of play around with that a little bit. I may leave that. Sometimes that just happens. Sometimes you make a mark and it just looks good. <laughs> I'm not sure if that mark is really looking great at this point, but um, kind of be, be okay with that, I think. You know, if you're, if you're in there and you're making a mark, but it's not exactly like what you're seeing in the reference, um, but it's contributing to your understanding of the, of the subject and go for it. All right, so here, this stretch along in here, wipe this back out. It's giving me trouble now. All right, so what do I need to do? All right, I'm looking for the landmarks now. So there's the turn here. That's one landmark. There's this upper portion here, the cheekbone. That's another landmark. and I have the space in between them. So I wanna make sure is that turn the right spot. If I draw a horizontal line across here, does that align properly? It should, looks pretty close. All right, so then in theory, this distance should be correct. So let me take the height of the, the nose opening. That gets me down to the bottom, the gum, bottom gum line of the teeth there. There's a 
tooth behind there. So I'm kind of just thinking through this specific shape. And now what, one of the things that's helping me right now is I'm doing some negative drawing. And actually, instead of looking at the teeth, I'm looking at this shape back in here to help me see that. Because what's happening is my mind is saying, draw a tooth. And with that comes all my preconceived notions about how a tooth should be drawn or what it looks like. And um, if I shift my thinking to this kind of abstract space behind it, it's a little bit easier to see it more objectively. I don't like the direction of marks there, so I'm gonna soften these up. I'm gonna take that other stab again. That angle, this seems too, too severe. So this is what I was talking about in terms of correction. You're constantly refining and correcting, and that's how you, you get to it. And that, the more you practice, the easier, you'll, it, it, the easier it'll be for you to hit those correct proportions more quickly, um, but it's really helpful to go through that exercise and, and continue to adjust as you go. Um, again, the, the natural tendency is to want to get to um, the final marks as soon as possible. You have to be open to, to change as you go. Uh, Nia is saying that the this distance here from the bottom of the nose to the upper lip might be slightly longer in the photo. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking too as well. Um, so one of the things what I was looking for is that this distance, the height of that nose opening, uh, should be the equivalent to the distance from the bottom of that nose opening to this bottom edge of the lower lip. And then if I take that then it's about another half of that distance to get to the bottom edge here. So I'm feeling confident about the distance from the nose to that bottom of the jaw. And so that means that I know I need to fit everything in there properly. And especially with the teeth, because they're so detailed, there's a tendency to make them larger than they actually are, or see them as larger than they actually are. Um, and so that I wanna be careful about that. Okay, I'm gonna come back in. I'm starting to get bogged down in it. This is all going to be generally light, so I'm going to erase that down, get rid of some of that. Um, all right, let's start. Let's, we'll actually start to get toward to a level of finish pretty soon. I've hardly done anything up here, but I think that works out okay. Um, this is bugging me a little bit that there's a kind of a halo here. I want to extend some of this value back in here. And in doing so, it just kind of clears my head a little bit. I like to do that, move to an area of the drawing that requires a little less thinking, um, and then come back to an area when I, when I need that focus. So having these larger background areas is kind of perfect for that. Um, and one of the other things that I'm observing is that the, what's being displayed on the camera, what the camera is catching, up, catching is a little bit different than what I'm seeing with my own eyes. I'm seeing a greater contrast in the camera's view, and that's helpful. Um, all right. What do I want to do? I'm going to finish this area here and then move down to the teeth. So what I want to do that do that, I'm going to think, think through this. I'm going to refine this edge here along that eye socket, and there's this there's this inversion here. So when I'm drawing the dark marks here, I'm actually drawing the brow and the, the bridge of the nose. As I move up, then all of a sudden when I'm working on that dark area, that's the interior of the eye socket. And so I wanna to try to capture that, that transition and I'm gonna come back in with the, the white to refine that. But I think I do wanna, I'm gonna use a line in here to indicate that edge. I'm just trying to be selective with it, not a heavy line all the way down. 
but just seeing where is the contrast a little bit higher in the photo and I can use a line to indicate that. Now I'm gonna bring, uh, bring my eraser in, gonna lighten this area up. How are we doing on time? We're about an hour in. I think at this rate we'll be done in about another half hour or so. This is just kind of a quick skull study. And so as you're following along, if you're new, you know, we kind of go for an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And we'll bring this up to a level of finish that we feel comfortable with. Um, but you may decide for yourself that you need more than, you need to take it even farther than what we've done here. And that's perfectly fine. The idea that I like to convey is that um, if you follow this process of allowing the drawing to emerge on the page and kind of working the whole thing, um, it puts you in the driver's seat with regards to detail. If you start a drawing by going for the details right away in one area, it kind of forces your hand to continue the drawing in that, in that or it gets you a little, um, it kind of confines things. And I like to build it up because um, there may be some areas in the drawing that are best served, it becomes more dramatic and more visually interesting to leave unfinished. So as I work on this shadow, I'm going to make sure that these marks aren't too directional. If I run these vertically, it's going to flatten things out. Um, if anything, I want to run these marks horizontally so they contrast against this vertical edge here, or when in doubt, just use a circular mark. That becomes kind of omnidirectional. Carmian Bowman, my name is Scott. My last name is Meyer. And this is Artist Networks drawing together. So I'm a video producer here at Artist Network um, and where we make a lot of instructional videos. We have blog content, we have magazines, the like Artist Magazine, Watercolor Artist, Pastel Journal, Southwest Art, etc. cetera. Um, so we all work together and my job is to produce the videos that we, we see but I also like to teach. All right, what are we doing here? I'm gonna move across here. That this, what's happening for me now is when I look at that shadow, it feels like a distinct shape. It doesn't feel like it's attached to that bone. It doesn't feel like it's attached to the skull. And I need to figure out why. Um, I don't have an immediate answer, so I'm going to actually come back to that and I'm just going to let my brain kind of sit on that while I work on another area. What do I have? I still have the HB, um, so I'm not, I haven't switched to the 6B yet. Um, this might be it. This is what I think I need to do is I need to create a contrast between the two edges of that shadow. I want the bone side to be a little bit sharper and let this side, the cast shadow that's on top of the skull, I want that to be a little bit softer. And so then what I can do is just kind of soften this edge just a little bit and see if that, see if that anchors it a bit. Sometimes it's the little things we do to edges that can make or break a drawing or take a, a decent drawing and make it even better. All right. So look back in here. I want to be mindful. I, what I see in this, the, the hole for the, the optic nerve is that it's sharper here and a little bit softer down in here. And let my, I can let my drawing reflect that. I hope I'm not cutting into the shot too much. Um, I'm trying to be mindful of that. There's just a little bit of a dark spot under here as well that we catch. And the kneaded eraser comes in here. All right, and then there's some detail in here I wanna capture. So right up in here, you know, it's interesting observing how that the eye socket, there's a, I think there's a tendency to want to see it as a, as a circle, as kind of more spherical, because a sphere would sit in it, but it's amazing to see how irregular it is of a shape. So 
So I'm just laying in some of these and I can refine it even farther with the blending stump here. Okay. And then um, if I want to create a little bit more variety in here to create more of a sense that it's a socket. And the way to do that is to really try to observe where does it get lighter or darker. It's so like right in here, it gets a little bit darker. So I'm just using these soft kind of circular marks in there. A little bit harsher here. All right. And I think I need, it looks like it gets darker right up along this edge right in here. So I can darken that out touch. And now that, that actually creates, I think, more of a, a three-dimensional quality to it, so I'm happy with that. And then when we add the white um, pastel pencil, it should really make that advance. All right, so here we go, let's do it. <laughs> Roberto just asked, no, I just knocked off the tip of my pencil there. <laughs> But Roberto, you just asked the question when I'm going to use the white, and I'm going to do that right now. Uh, so the way I'm going to do that is I'm observing where are the hot spots. So there are certain areas where I feel like it's a, a bit more intense. So like right in here, um, right up along this edge, right along the brow. There's some right here, under the cheekbone, just doing kind of a mental check-in. Um, I see it also catching right in here. And I'm going to build into that. And then I want to see the broad um, value. So like right in here, for example, there seem, this seems to all be in light. And then it transitions across into here. Um, so I'm going to use these kind of circular marks. not really laying down much what's going on here. I think I actually need a little bit more that core. So I'm going to take my razor blade. I can just do that right here. So you can see it. This is how I sharpen my pencil. This is how you sharpen a pencil with a dull blade. I can feel like it's too dull. Don't worry, I'll clean that up. And I can feel that there's a bit of like a, an adhesive or something um, that attaches the pastel to the casing of the pencil. Um, so I want to just be careful with that. that. That can often be a place where you end up breaking the, the core. All right, yeah, that lays a bit more flat and I can get an, a broader area. All right, so and now as I'm doing this, as I'm building up this kind of haze of white, I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers so that I'm kind of rounding that out. I'm not getting any hot spots. Uh, and I want, I want to be careful with this edge. I kind of like the way the edge is right now. So I'm not working the white right up to it. There might be a spot up here where I can do that and create this alternating sequence of dark and light as we follow along that edge to try to get that to pop a bit more. So just soft circular marks. This is really just the weight of the pencil at this point as I'm building up value. Um, and then I'm going to gradually increase the pressure in those areas of the hot spots. There's some detail back in there that I want to get at a little bit later. Some directional marks that are showing up. I want to get rid of those. I feel like I can get in, get some light in here, starting with it really lay down flat. And if I need more, I can kind of lean in and get more of a, engage the, the point of the pencil a little bit more. One of the things I'm also trying to be mindful of when I do this is I'm putting the, the, the pressure on the material at all, if, if any, it's in the, kind of the center of the stroke and letting it kind of lift off the page. And, and so I'm not leaning into it and then coming back where I leave a kind of a harsh edge on that mark. And then as, as I'm laying this down, if I'm seeing areas that are 
kind of streaky, then I can kind of lean in and start to fill it in with the, the point of the pencil a little bit more. All right, how's that work? Okay, that works out okay. Starting to come together. You know, that, that's just building up that base layer of, of white. Uh, and I can lay down a little bit more in here as well. And I want to remind myself to make these circular marks. And here you can, I can start to see kind of a, a vertical plane right in here that will enhance. So it's all very soft and subtle. It's showing up better on the camera than it is for me here. So I'm doing a lot of checking in with the, the camera shot just to see where I'm at with regards to value. And then as I work across here, I'll be mindful of that edge. See if there's an opportunity to correct any of those lines. Make sure I'm still feeling comfortable with the proportions. And then this, again, this is just still using the weight of the pencil. I haven't applied any pressure because we're gonna, we're gonna really make this pop in a bit when we can add some more, more pressure. And then there's, it, over in here, it's kind of mixing with some of the charcoal, which is okay. I feel like that works out all right. It's giving me an interesting tone. And then as I work on that nose, what I want to do is work on that background cheekbone first. And see what subtle variations in value I can observe. But I kind of like the way it's kind of an atmospheric edge there. And I don't want to overdo it. I want to keep that edge soft. You can see how it really gets lost in here. I like that. Um, Linda is asking if we're gonna use the, the stump with the white. I'm not gonna do that in this one. Um, if you do want to use the stump to kind of blend, then uh, if you have an extra one, that would be good. It's gonna be really hard to use this one that's all dirty with the, the white. So I'm just, I'm just gonna let it sit as it is. So let me see, as I look at this, one of the things that I, I, I wanna kind of be mindful of as well is kind of these soft transitions and I'm, I'm looking to see if there are harder edges that I can soften up. Um, but if we go back, if you, if you do wanna watch the, the first skull drawing video and see the different approach to it, it can be kind of helpful. And that's what I'm kind of curious to see if, there, if I have a better understanding of the skull um, here you can see with, a, uh, with a, the nose kind of coming in at an angle here, the light catches in this little divot on that cheekbone. So I want to try to observe the shape of that, that light a bit. And then there's another little divot right in here. And it's such a soft transition, so I want to continually be mindful to feather that out a little you know, as, as I go. So I'm really using the side of the pencil here as much as possible. So now that we have the kind of that first pass with that, I can come back in and again, look for those hot spots. So right in here, as we come across, there's some subtle variation. And then there's a hot spot right here in that corner of the, that lower eye socket on the top of that cheekbone. And if that's too intense, I can soften it a little bit, kind of feather that out run my marks vertically to reflect that vertical plane. And then there's a little bit of a highlight here that catches on that turn of the cheekbone right here. It hits that and then it turns back, you know, past the temple, back into that jaw. And right at that turn is where the light increases and it becomes more intense. I see some subtle cracks that I can start to indicate. And as we come up here, you see this thin light and it's just small circular marks here. 
to create that rather than a line. And on the brow, I think catches a little bit more light so I can look for areas where I can fill it in a little bit more, apply a little bit more pressure here. I'm gonna sharpen up this edge just a touch. And if I ever drop in too much white, we're just trying to, trying to sneak up on it, but if I ever go too far with, with it, I can use the side of my finger to kind of lift up some of it. And then here I can kind of suggest that, that crease there where the top of the skull kind of comes off. And right in here, I feel like that's a bit too dark, so I'm going to use my kneaded eraser. And it's just too kind of sharp, too harsh of an edge there that I want, so I want to soften this a bit. Sorry, I haven't paid attention to the, the uh, <laughs> haven't paid attention to the questions. Uh, medieval peasant, yes, we do make a uh, pastel journal, is the question. And my colleague Ann is the editor there. All right. Thank you for some of these comments here. Lindy, I'll be proud of my drawing when done. Awesome. Yes, we make uh, pastel journal, Southwest art, and artist magazine, as well as watercolor artist. Okay, so now I've done very little with the nose socket. I'm feeling good about the rest of that, that structure. I kind of like the way this is just left unfinished. I may come back in and add just a little bit to clarify that. Um, but here's what I'm going to do with the edge of this. This is going to be a lot of fun because you can see a thin glint of light catching on the edge of that nose, but it's not a perfect line. There's some variation to it. So I want to use the side of my pencil to do this, and I'm going to be rolling it in my fingers as I go to create a more organic line. And it's just kind of this gentle kind of wiggle as I go down that edge. You can see it right across here. And as I come down here, I want to try to be mindful of the Uh, the specifics of that edge. And again, I'm kind of just letting the, the pencil roll on my fingers. I'm breaking that edge up on purpose um, so that it feels more naturalistic. And then I want this, this bottom edge, I think I need to intensify. So now I can start to really work my way down into the teeth area. And then if I need to, I need to create it more of a gradient back in here. And I have kind of a peculiar way of holding the pencil that may or may not work for you, but I like to hold it on its side like this um, because then I can, I can use these fingers to stabilize it so I have the control of the tripod grip of this grip, um, but I can use the side of it as well and I can control the pressure a bit more easily. I can just use the weight of the, the pencil or I can really lean into it. So I, I, I don't know where or when I started working um, this way, but I just you know, found myself doing that. Uh, so as I'm looking at this, the kind of the values and interior wise, it gets a little bit lighter on the outside, darker on the inside, but I want to be, I want to be mindful of that edge and create a gradation there. And right in there, you can visualize that, that bottom plane that leads into the nose. And then, actually, there's a little bit of light catching in, in here. So much can be accomplished by using the side of the pencil, and it's often interpreted by the viewer as a more natural line. So if you're going for realism, Really try to use the side of the pencil a bit more than if, um, if you're struggling with that. Um, and then use this tripod grip when you need um, kind of a sharper edge and you want to get perhaps a more expressive line. OK. 
Okay. Now the teeth. This, this is the part that my brain has been kind of dreading <laughs> this whole time. And I've done this so many times, I know I can do this, but I really am questioning things right now. So um, we'll see how we go. Okay. Um, great questions. So we see questions here. Um, uh, Mary B is asking, my eyes don't look three-dimensional. Does that mean my shading is off? So it, it could be. Um, and you know, and also look at the direction of your marks. And so um, if you need to, allow your marks to really follow that socket. So if, you're, if we're looking at here, we're on the interior of that socket. When we come up under here, then this brow bone comes in on top of it. So allow that mark to really cut in underneath this brow bone, and that might be helpful as well. And then the other thing that could also be looking look for as in terms of directional marks is that bottom plane going into the eye socket right in here. So you can change the direction of your mark so they move they push inward like that and then kind of curve in this way. Give that a shot and then see if there's enough value contrast. Oh, that's actually this one spot in here. The light is catching in the bowl of that eye socket. And I didn't, I didn't bring that out. So you can see that it's actually lighter back here and darker here. So let me, let me erase that out. And it's really hard to see the edge of that, that eye socket there. So let me uh, see if I can clarify that a little bit and then drop in some value, some lighter value, and then feather that out a little bit. And this a little bit lighter under here as well. Again, it's softer at this bottom edge of that curve, so I'm gonna let that soften a bit. I'm just trying to be mindful of the pressure and create a gradient as we move out of that eye socket. And actually what I want to do, I think, is I allow these values to mix a little bit. So I'm just using now the white pastel as a blending tool. How do we feel about that? That works a bit better. Now there's a bit more contrast. So typically you get those highlights around the curves, either the outer, the convex curves or the inner concave spots where the light really kind of condenses. So that's what we're seeing back there. Yes, uh, Insane Tuna saying you made a realistic shaped skull from clay and I was surprised how hard it was with all those compound curves. Exactly. Those compound curves are really what figure drawing, what um, drawing a skull is all about, what portrait drawing. Uh, observing those sh subtle shifts um, in the curves would be helpful. So right now, I know I need to work on this area a bit more. So what I... Um, just kind of sacrificing this part right here, using that as a way to kind of pick up charcoal on my blending stump. Oh, I, I want to get back in there. I really like what's happening right in here. There's a lot of cool texture, so I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that a little bit more later. Let's get to that teeth. So what I want to do is look for try to observe the shapes of the shadows, and I'm gonna bring the highlights in on top. How do I do this? Let's see. If I find the kind of the central axis of the mouth, it kind of comes down through here. What tooth is there? It's kind of, there's this front tooth that has a flat part to it. And then there's, then there's two other teeth moving across here. I move over to this tooth, the next tooth, and I'm just looking for the shape of the shadow that's formed by it. Come over to it. The, the, we have the center tooth. We have one, two. We have another tooth. I wish I knew. Rachel, you may know the, the specific terms of these teeth. I do not. Um, 
But my the thing that's important to me is I want to do a quick check-in now. Where am I relative to other landmarks in the drawing? And in this case, this tooth here, we have our center tooth, one, two over, and it's right below this side of the nose socket. Um, and so now I know I'm kind of in the right spot and I'm kind of working my way across, but I'm keeping my marks light and loose because I may get off on these. Um, so now I know I need to fit um, from this tooth here, there's one, two, three, four teeth. And I'm observing how these shadows are really kind of like these thin triangles. And then we come over here to the molars and they kind of change up a little bit. Okay. Now I can do the same with these teeth. And if I look at the reference photo, it's all very subtle. We know the teeth have those edges and we know that they're there. But if you look at the reference photo, and especially if you squint, all of those lines disappear. And so we can use, our, use that to inform our drawing and allow the drawing to be just as subtle as the reference photo. The, the trouble I see in a lot of beginning students' work is to overstate those things. It's like drawing fingers. Um, drawing teeth are like that where we have a tendency to overstate them. We know that they're there and they're important to us as humans. Um, so we have a tendency to, to overstate them. And I actually want to try to suggest them more than anything. So that's why I like using this blending stump to kind of sneak up on those forms and start by establishing, establishing the light and shadow. Um, it, because then I can ease into the detail rather than starting with a heavy line that we then try to minimize. I just need to pick up a little bit more charcoal, so I'm going to this dark section there. If you are new, I'd love, to, love for you to shout out if you haven't done so already. See where you're viewing from. And again, if you're new, this is Drawing Together with Artist Network. So we do this every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. I just need to kind of clear my head a little bit, move to something else, come back now to the teeth. That's it. You'll, you'll notice that's kind of a big part of my process is to try to clear my head. It gets easily overwhelmed. I studied a, the strange discipline of hypnotherapy for just for fun. And one of the terms we used was message unit overload. <laughs> so, and I love that term to describe what happens in drawing so much of the time. You know, it, what happens when our brain is it confronted with so much information that it kind of has to shut down. I reached message unit overload. I needed to move to another spot, clear that a little bit, and then I can come back. Message unit overload. So easy to happen these days with so much information being out there in the world. Ah, and then one of the things I didn't really observe was this shadow under here being cast by that cheekbone. I'm gonna overstate that, and then I'm gonna use my eraser to cut that back out. Okay, so now that we have the teeth suggested, I can go through and I can start to add more specific detail. So if I start over here, what I'm looking for are the areas of dark, dark. So here's that main tooth. There's no dark, dark there. Just a little thin pick there. And so I wanna be mindful, not only of where those marks go, how big they are, but also what is the path that they follow. I have that roughly established but before I make a mark, I want to do a quick check-in. Where am I relative to other landmarks? So a quick vertical plumb line and a horizontal mark, as well as a quick check-in on that path. And you get these little kind of triangular marks. And, and it's, it's so powerful what can be done with those. How much information can be conveyed there? So, and then once I'm confident that I know where it needs to go, 
I can look at that specific mark. Is it longer, shorter, is it more round, is it triangular? And then there's more distinct shadow in here. Okay. Now I can do that with the, the lower teeth and I'm gonna work my way in to find that, um, find that the center line. Susan123, welcome. I'm glad this is helpful. Um, Rachel, all right, saying it's central incisors are the two front, lateral incisors come next, then cuspids or canines, next are bicuspids, so thank you, and then molars. I knew you would know. Uh, Joy Kurtz is saying my proportions are all off, so I've either drawn a Simpson or my drawing gives proof that man evolved from apes. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, this one is way harder than the cup. You know, it's interesting how that happens, but I think, you know, in, in general, if um, you, know, you, you bring up the drawing of the cup. That's one of the reasons I like to start with something like that is it's a relatively simple object, but it's also challenging um, because of its curves. It's one of the, those familiar objects that we often take for granted. Um, but if the, the principles that we apply to that cup drawing are the same as we apply here. Ah. Here's what I did. I placed those dark marks. I completely lost track of the path that they should follow. Um, so this curve right here is completely off. I need to invert that. It needs to actually round up like this. We have this kind of downward pull and then an upward kind of inverted kind of curve that way. All right, so I've lost track. I've got my tooth, the So we're going to just suggest these teeth, and I feel like that's, that's too far up because we don't have enough room for all the teeth. Um, a medieval peasant. Oh, I didn't forget. I didn't mention the size of this early on, so thank you for bringing it up. This is a 9 by 12 drawing to give you a sense of its scale. So relatively small, um, and I think it's important that you find the scale that works for you. Um, I, in general, like the larger you go, the easier it is to control the proportions because things are less, you know, off by less to a lesser degree, you know, proportionally. Okay, now I've kind of lost things over there. Let me see. I think I need to pick up more charcoal. I'm actually, going to do this. I'm just going to pick up more charcoal on my blending stump. And now try to define the edges of the teeth using this blending stump. And become a bit more specific with these. So I've kind of lost track. But I think in general, when you have detail, when you have something like this, like teeth, um, it helps to start with the big proportions first and then gradually refine that. So if you start with the outer edges and you're confident in those and you find your center, then you can divide that even farther and then start to break it up. And then once, you've, once you're confident uh, or more confident in the placement of, of each of those pieces, then it, it, each one kind of informs the other. There's a lot going on here up in the gum line that I think I'm actually going to tackle with the with the white chalk. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the that front tooth right in here. There's just this is just a hot mess right over there. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, there's so much going on, but it's really hard to see. So I'm just going to try to suggest it. I don't. You know, you don't have to really state things clearly. It's like if I were to put text on, like, you know, when we did, we did the drawing of the building, we did that lobster shack um, down at Five Islands, um, the Five Islands Wharf. We drew that a while back, and there was text on the side of the building that said Five Islands. Um, and 
you don't need to define each letter perfectly clearly and actually be overwhelming for the senses. Um, and so I want to kind of keep that same thinking here is suggest the teeth more than anything. So I'm making a bit of a mess. Remember every, draw every drawing goes through an ugly duckling stage and then you can also apply that to a section of the drawing. So this is the ugly duckling stage for the tooth, for the teeth, but it's coming together and we'll gradually refine that. Okay. So now I think what I need to do is do some drawing. Um, yeah, drawing with the white pencil here. I think, yeah, this, uh, who is it that, um, Adele is saying, I think the teeth are too low in the upper jaw. I believe that's right. Um, so what I wanna do is look at this shape in here. I'm gonna start back in here. There's this kind of, there's this form here, the, the, this tooth that's catching the light pretty well. We have this other tooth and then there's the light catching that edge right there. And we have this gum line. I'm gonna to try to get that gum line in there where the light's catching that a little bit more clearly. And I feel like I feel like that proportion is correct, but I could be off there. Uh, so next we move over to the, that center tooth that we started with, the name of which I have already lost. And you can see on that one tooth, it's generally you're catching the light on the face of it, but then it catches really more along that edge. Come over here and there's this tooth where the light, there's a hot spot right in there. And I wanna to try to rely on the highlights to help define the teeth. Uh, Medieval Peasant is saying you prefer smaller scale, how large is too large? Um, this is this is a scale that I'm kind of comfortable working with for this type of thing. I'm doing a study, um, and it seems to match the scale of the marks and to match the scale of my observations. It's pretty much one to one. It's a little bit. This is a little bit larger than the reference photo, so I'm not quite doing sight size. A little bit larger. Um, but I, I think you know you want to kind of work at the scale that that again, just kind of works for you. What feels good in terms of your marks, the marks you're making that align with your observations um, because that's that's going to be the big thing. And also, like, the, the larger you go, again, you, you have a bit more forgiveness in the proportion. So if you're off by an eighth of an inch in a large drawing, um, that's very different than being off by an eighth of an inch here. Um, and so a large-scale drawing can be more forgiving, but then you're also covering a large area. And for me, when I, when I work much larger than this, then what I do is I find myself um, spending a lot of time just filling in the paper. And for me, I prefer to have a scale that allows me to um, kind of express a form more directly. You know, I like that if I can, I can make one mark with a pencil and it can define, say, a tooth, um, and I don't have to spend too much time kind of filling in and just building up um, marks. If that makes sense. So it's going to vary for, for, from person to person. I mean, I've done very large drawing. I, I remember doing a full size, full size, life size um, self portrait uh, one time. And so it was, you know, I'm, what, five, nine ish. Um, so it was, that was the size of the drawing. Um, and that was a lot of fun. It took me a few weeks to work on it. And, um, but again, there's a lot of just building up marks. Um, all right, so I wanna refine this edge a little bit. I'm kinda of getting burnt out on the teeth, so I'm gonna move over here to the jaw. I feel like a little less is at stake there. Uh, look at this hole here. There's not a, just a flat black shape, but there's some variety in there.
then as I come across here, I want to look at what's happening here. There's a little bit darker here. There's a cast shadow that defines that edge that I can drop in. Cast shadow here. And it gets really dark in here. And that back, I've got a lobe. I think I actually just want a line to define this edge. Um, and then right in here, I can, I can bring that light in. So trying to do some observations, it doesn't go right up to the edge, there's hot spots kind of right inside here. And so I like to start again with just a pressure that's, that's pretty light, just the weight of the material itself and then gradually drop it in. This is where I can start to suggest some of this texture and I'm not being very precise with the placement of these but I'm just kind of reacting to what I'm seeing. Trying to suggest that as much as possible. Ooh. Now you get these, these cool little ridges the light is catching and it's all irregular. So I'm allowing the pencil to kind of roll in my fingers, trying to observe that path. Kind of leaning in on it a little bit. And I think what, what's more important for me is to, that mark to feel naturalistic, not match the photo one to one. So here we get these kind of S-shaped marks. And they get kind of tighter, closer together here. And I want to vary that. I don't want this to be too strong. Just kind of suggest it. So again, a lot of that's just allowing the pencil to kind of roll through the fingers. All right, I think that works. And then I kind of like what's happening back in here. I think all I need to do is kind of define this edge just a little bit more. Again, it's not a direct interpretation of the photo because I want to I like that more kind of expressive line and a little, that this is a little bit more unfinished back there. Um, so now I can get back to the teeth because that was, it was just kind of exhausting working on them and I needed to kind of clear my head a little bit. Uh, what do I need? I need the that's the 6B, I need the 4B, or the HB, I'm sorry. And now I can kind of come back in and start to sharpen up some of the teeth where I where I need them to be. I'm working just on the upper teeth right now. And I'm putting more emphasis kind of on the corners of the teeth rather than a whole line. You can see it's more like a, co a collection of dots than anything. I'm trying to keep myself from getting bogged down on those details um, and overstating the, overstating the teeth. So it's just the weight of the pencil that, that I'm really kind of using right now. How does that work? I feel like that works out a little, little better. Not sure I got the scale right. I think, um, who was it that was saying earlier that, that this distance might be too great? I think I think the, the teeth do feel a little bit too short, but I think I'm close enough to the ballpark that, and have demonstrated the process enough that hopefully it works for you. And, you know, I, it's one of the things that I've, I've mentioned before, but you know, when you're evaluating your work, you want to at least for me, I want to have something that I can improve. That's that's what keeps me moving on to the next one. Um, ideally, I'd be like 99% happy with a drawing, so I'm like feeling proud and feeling good about it, but there's just that one little thing that I want to try to do better the next time. Um, and I think it's also just as important to identify what you're doing well. So if you are kind of, if you're feeling um, kind of confident about your work, that's good. Um, and try to identify what can be improved. And if, you're, if you find yourself beating yourself up uh, on your drawing, 
I think it's really important that you take the time to acknowledge what's going well. Um, and, and that's just not, not just a matter of making the experience better for you and feeling better, but it's really critical in terms of expanding your learning. If you don't acknowledge what you're doing well, is you're less likely to carry that into the next one. And so um, I think that's, that's for me why it's, it's so important to do that. So I'm just working on that negative space in here. Now with the white, I'm gonna try to suggest the teeth over here. And I'm noticing like the shape of the gums is actually more visible you can see how they really kind of wrap around the root of the of each of these teeth. So I think that's ultimately more valuable for me right now when I'm working on that area. And now I'm kind of trying to pay attention to where I am, which tooth is which, and what's above which. Yeah, I'm off by a little bit right in here. I got a kind of have a missing tooth. All right, so here we go. Okay, that's just become a hot mess over there. So let me see if I can clean this up now. I'm gonna smudge that out and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna kind of switch my thinking to by, by looking at the highlights. Placing the shadows wasn't really working for me. Uh, so now I need to change approaches and place highlights. I feel like what I had done is, yeah, it kind of been offset a little bit by, with the teeth. So hopefully this helps. I know teeth are one of the things that people, have, you know, when I was you know, teaching a lot, um, that was one of the questions I, I got quite a bit was, I need to draw teeth. Hopefully this is helpful in, in, in explaining that, or at least showing an approach to it. Um, because then from here, you know, you can just continue to refine it. Um, these shadows are too dark, so I need to pick those off. But really it's about kind of suggesting first and then becoming more explicit with it and really kind of defining it more clearly. So I think that's, that's close enough. Close enough for now so that we can move forward. Um, this, again, it's off. Something seems off there. So let me, let me take a look now here. I grabbed the 6B accidentally. That's all right. On a roll. Just need to drop that, drop this line down a little bit. And I like, I like using that line for some reason um, versus darkening this background. I'm using that line to define the edge. And broken lines are more naturalistic. Now I can come back in with this and in general, I just need more light across the face. So 
So again, trying to observe the hot spots and kind of easing into them. Um, so as I come down here, looking at what happens to the highlights underneath each of the teeth, where you can see kind of these ridges. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the instincts that we often have is to make marks kind of regular and evenly spaced. And so I'm trying to break that instinct. So how's everybody doing? We're an hour and a quarter, hour and three quarters in. So we're, we've really put in some time on this one. Um, you know, I think there's definitely some areas where I could continue to improve, like in the teeth. Um, so I can kind of pick away at it a little bit, um, but the, you know, hopefully that what this does is it inspires you, you get some ideas on how you might finish it. You may take this even farther, add more detail to the teeth. Um, and you, one of the things that you'll notice too is that, you know, we, you know, like, like I said, starting on the toned paper kind of forces my hand a little bit to not think about these objects as being white. You know, they are white. This is a white skull. Um, and but by going starting with the gray, it it forces me to see the subtleties in that. In that, if I were to start with a white piece of paper, I think there's a tendency to want to preserve as much of that white as possible, and not really get as full or as rich a value range as we can. Uh, so it, kind of keep that in mind as well as you're working. You know, it's just like when drawing eyes, we know the whites of the eyes to be white, but in reality, they're generally falling in, into the eye socket, into shadow, where they, um, you know, they're, where they're really more gray than anything. So uh, I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, the next drawing, the drawing for next week is an orange. Um, I'm really excited about that one. I just posted that. So if you go to artistnetwork.com and you follow the link that's in the description below, it'll take you to the show page where you can share your own drawings. Um, and you're also going to see the next one that's coming up. Uh, so we meet again every, every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. We're in the process of developing additional ones. I've got a, a really exciting new acrylic painting series with Gigi Chen. Uh, and she's a really wonderful artist. Um, we have our live series with Johannes, the paint-alongs. Those are a lot of fun. Uh, we um, so check those out. Each artist brings a different perspective to use a, an art term in there. Um, so if you check those out. I know we have one coming up this weekend with Johannes, the uh, the breakthroughs where he's doing a seascape in watercolor. I'm looking forward to that one. So again, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to hang out a little bit. Um, Linda's saying the stump works on white. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, I usually have one that I use to, to shade, um, but I didn't grab it today. Um, and I just have the one that's already been contaminated by the charcoal. Um, but again, I wanna thank you all for being here. It's been an awesome conversation. I'm gonna hang out to see if there are any additional questions. Um, the, uh, it doesn't, doesn't look like we have anything but again, I, it's, it's so funny, it cracks me up every time, every time there's a question that comes in right after I sign off. So I keep telling myself I'm gonna hang out and catch everything, but I invariably miss, miss somebody, but I'm just kind of cleaning things up. Um, you may take it even farther. You could spend a few more hours on yours and really kind of dial it in. Um, or you may choose to become kind of looser with yours and kind of sketchier, but so thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great weekend. I will see you all next week, Wednesday. I'm excited about it. Then we got to get ready for the October, the October drawings. I can't believe October is already here. Um, Mary is asking where to find the acrylic classes. We don't have those posted yet. We're going to be working. Our goal is to have that live at the end of October. So in about four weeks, we'll have that whole series hopefully dialed in and ready to go. And that's going to be another free one on YouTube. Um, if you're looking for Johannes, go to the paint along page there. Yeah, actually, if you go to the homepage in Artist Network, I think you're going to see something there about the upcoming event. So if you're interested in uh, working on watercolor. So uh, 
he's got a great community there. People are really open and friendly. And uh, so learn quite a bit. Oh, uh, Joy is saying, let's see, let me see if I can catch your, your question. Um, so if you're uh, 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 not finding your question, Joy, but if, uh, if you're asking where to find the earlier skull drawing, if you go to artistnetwork.com slash drawing together, or if you go to the homepage, you're going to see drawing together at the top. Click on that, and that takes you to the drawing together landing page. It has all the episodes laid out. You're going to see drawing skull number one and skull number two. So this is skull number two. Skull number one is the one that I did you know, a couple months ago, um, and that's where you'll be able to find that. Or you can, you can continue to scroll through in the playlist here on YouTube um, where you can find all the old episodes that way as well. So that's a great question. Uh, Thomas is asking about Inktober info. I imagine it will be. Um, I will kind of do some research, but it, we, that Inktober is something that we, we definitely kind of participate in as well. We like to have content around ink drawing coming up for Inktober. All right, thank you all so much. See you all, have a great weekend.